It's right before 2 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17. Rhonda, good to have you back in the house. I know y'all been traveling. 1 Kings. People tell me all the time, oh, I, we still watch you, Pastor. It blesses, blesses us here. 1 Kings chapter 17. Are you comfortable? Been a while. I've got to keep you on your toes. College football starts in two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes say, Lord, just let me live one more year. This, we all need to keep praying and we stay. Heaven don't need us right now. Heaven don't need us right now. The earth needs us. Let me tell you something. Salt is not scared of corruption. Light is not scared of darkness. We'll say it again. Salt is not scared of corruption. And light is not scared of darkness. No matter what happens on the political landscape, remember, God called you to be salt and light. You hear me? Some of you get nervous about that. You forgot who you are. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Hallelujah. Last week, I mentioned to you about a prophet, Elijah. Remember that? And I, I put Elijah at Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. And then, and then it's almost like God got on to me and said, hey. Now, God don't talk that way to me. <coughs> Excuse me. That's my wife. <coughs> God, he, he's just like he said, look, you need to back up. Because one of the things I've learned in life is we all don't know the Bible. And we're all learning the Bible. And so when we hear, I want you to learn it. So how did this man Elijah get to Mount Carmel? There was a three-year span in which it happened. And so this three years, and it might have been even three and a half, but I know that it's at least three years. First Kings chapter 17, we're going to talk to you about a provision. How many know God is a provider? Amen. The scripture calls him Jehovah Jireh. Uh, if there's one thing that we get nervous about in life, it's our security, uh, our provision, how, you know, we, we work, uh, we provide, and, but how we forget sometimes God is our provider. And he provides for us. Long before there was Social Security, long before there was retirement, there was God taking care of his people. Amen. And because this stuff, what we do now, is an American thing. But back in that day, God had to take care of you till you died. And you had to believe God for it until you died. Okay, you follow me? So this prophet, Elijah, that God had called, the Scripture tells us in verse 1, Now Elijah the Tishbite, and Gilead said to Ahab, and remember, Ahab's a king. He didn't call him King Ahab. He called him Ahab. He took away that because Ahab's wicked, and his wife is wicked, Jezebel. And we all, nobody names their kids Jezebel. When last time you saw a girl, hey, what's up, Jezebel? Nobody names their kid Jezebel. Amen. We just don't do it. Uh, don't do it. Name me cat that, but don't name don't, don't name a woman that, all right? Everybody follow me? So here, he, he goes there, and he sees Ahab, and he, and he says, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Dew nor rain. The importance of dew was to bring fertile, fertile land or, or to bring forth fruit, and so was the rain. There was an issue with that because Ahab and Jezebel served a god named Baal, B-A-E-L. Baal was the god of rain and dew. And so when Elijah said, it ain't going to rain nor have dew in the next three years, it was God's way of shutting down the little G, the little god of the heathen Ahab and Jezebel. You follow me? And what they would do is they would sacrifice babies to this god Baal. <laughs> Oh, doesn't sound like America at all, does it? So they'd sacrifice children to this God and run the babies through the fire, just like, uh, uh, it's, just, it's just wicked. So the word of the Lord came, no more rain for three years. Judgment has come, all right? And the word of the Lord came to him after that. He said, now I want you to depart, Elijah. When you make a word like that, you better run, right? So run. Turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. A lot of brooks in the area, but this was a particular brook named Cherith. 
You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went, and he did according to the word of the Lord. So not only did he give the word of the Lord, he was listening to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook, Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. I have said this for years. We don't need three meals a day. I've even said it at camp. We ought to quit feeding these kids three meals a day. Feed them twice a day. We got this three meal a day thing in our head. I don't know who come up with that. But two meals is enough. Just saying. So they, they fed them in the morning, bread and meat. And fed them in the evening, bread and meat. And he drank from the brook. Verse 7, very important. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Of course there was no rain. Why was there no rain? Because he said there'd be no rain. Father, I thank you for your word again. Help me get this word across in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you're taking notes, I want you to write a few things down. First thing I would tell you is when God guides, he provides. Anytime God guides you somewhere, he'll provide for you. When God prescribes something, we follow that prescription, and there's a provision that's attached to it. This man, Elijah, the prophet of God, there was a significance in this sign because, again, the God of Israel at that time was Baal. And when this word came, God shut him down for three years. There'd be no more rain at this, uh, for, for that time. And, it, of course, it was a slap in the face to, to this God. It was a slap in the face to Ahab. And no, that means the animals were dying. There were people dying. It was, a, it was a tough time. And to focus more on God's guidance than his provision. Now, I want you to hear this word again. We got to focus more on God's guidance than his provision. Many times we just say, God, provide, provide. And God is saying, I'm trying to lead you somewhere. I'm trying to lead you somewhere. I'm trying to lead you to this job, uh, this career this place and if we listen to the word of the lord and we go where god tells us to go god will provide for us so listen for him for guidance because when god guides you he'll provide for you it's very important believers you know as believers we all start a sheep you know that man that we all start a sheep now i, I say we start a sheep because i do believe in my heart that god does not want us to stay sheep he wants you to grow into being a lion Amen, to be leaders. You, it, we just heard the second song said, the lion of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. If he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the tribe has to be lions, not sheep. So we start out as sheep. Now, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Amen. So as sheep, we understand that God guides us. And, and as sheep, he provides for us. Uh, and again, I would say to you that God wants us. He, he wants to take care of our burdens. Amen. He wants to look after us. But sheep... <sighs> Sheep get lost easy. Sheep will settle for muddy, unclean water unless a shepherd guides them away from it. When sheep follow the shepherd, they find themselves in green pastures, amen, clean waters under the protection of the shepherd. When it comes to our finances, we have to understand we don't need to be a shepherd. We have a shepherd. We have one that leads us and guides us. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. David said, he said, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me. Everybody say, he leads me. So I got to remind myself, God's always leading me. He, he's heading me somewhere because if he leads me, he'll provide for me. He leads me to still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. You know, we should not be anxious, stressed out, or worried. This was why Jesus repeatedly told his followers not to worry, but he said, seek the kingdom of God. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, seek first the kingdom of God. We have financial fears. We're concerned. Some of you have 401ks. You've got, you're concerned about the Social Security, things of that, that stuff. For most of us, it's not our financial problems that hurt us. It's our financial worries that hurt us. A lot of you got money, but you're still worried about it. You're still concerned about it. Fears about finances bring anxiety. And the thought of how am I going to provide? All these, what happens if my spouse was to pass? Even all these unnecessary worries would be necessary if you were a sheep without a shepherd. But well, we got a shepherd. We got a good shepherd. Amen. And as believers, well, we, we understand our shepherd does not sleep. He doesn't slumber. And let him have concern for you. John 10, 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. But I came that you may have life and life more abundantly. I believe in abundant life. 
Amen. So when God led this man, Elijah, he said, I'm going to provide for you. Now, he didn't know where he was going to go. But when he said, I'm going to shut the heavens by the word of the Lord, that means even he is going to suffer unless God does something for him. So he says, I'm going to lead you to a brook named Cherith. When you get there, I want you to stay there. Listen, when God guides, he hides. Sometimes he just hides you. He hid him. He said, I want you to go hide. Because why? Ahab and Jezebel put a, a price out on his neck. They wanted to take care of him. Amen. So he hid him by the brook Cherith. Elijah was not only provided for by God, but God's protection is part of God's provision. God's provision is not limited to what God brings to you. It includes what God keeps from you. Do you realize how many hospital bills that God has kept you from? Do you realize how many diseases God has kept you from? Amen. Do you realize how many times God has protected your kids when they've been away from you driving a vehicle when they were 16 years old? Or uh, 14 or 15 year old when they said, can I just borrow the keys? I remember telling my mama, I just let me borrow the keys. I'm going to run down to the store. <laughs> Two hours later. God not only provides for us, but he protects us. And God hid him there to look after him. I don't know how long he was there, but there's a three-year span in which he was hid. He was hid there at the brook, and he was hid at a widow's house. For three years, God hid this man till he ended up at Mount Carmel to take care of the prophets of Baal. So you got this extent. Three, we don't even understand. 12, 24, 36 months, he hid him. He, we, we struggle with time. If God don't do something by Tuesday that we prayed for on Sunday. We done gave up on Wednesday. Seriously. We get frustrated with God. I mean, we get mad at him. I mean, we ready to quit. By Thursday, we done backslid. By Friday, you calling the pastor. By Saturday, you done changed churches. <laughs> ain't right. So it includes what God keeps from us, sometimes without us even realizing it. You know, Jezebel put a head out on him. So here he's, he's hid in this place. So God's protection and blessing, as he guides us, he hides us. God's blessing is not always in stuff we get. It's also in stuff we don't get. Thank God for the stuff you didn't get. Thank God for the prayers that God didn't answer. God has protected us here in South Texas. Amen. When the storms went through, I mentioned, uh, you know, Brian, y'all were the only house I know that was hit by a tree. But so many were missed over and over. And by the way, the tree didn't hit you. It didn't take you out. Gave you a second chance. I know the floods hit us, amen, and through our homes. I thank God for his protection. I thank God that there, nobody got electrocuted. I thank God that the floods didn't take things away. You know, that there were families that were protected. Over and over, I saw what God did. Yeah, there were things that were taken away, but God also provided things back to us. Amen. And the scripture tells us that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers him. I thank God for angels. I thank God for the angels of goodness and mercy that I ask to look after my children. I am grateful not only for what God brings into my life, but what God keeps away from my life. Remember Jabez last week in Chronicles 4, 9, he called upon the name of, uh, the, name of it, the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border and that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from harm so that it might not bring me pain. And God granted him his request. I, I talked with a pastor this week. He said, I've been praying this prayer every day. I talked with another man in Arkansas. He said, I've been praying this prayer every day over my family that God would protect me and enlarge my borders. Nothing wrong with that. Last night I was praying before I went to bed. Oh, I thank you for blessing me. I thank you for blessing me. You have blessed me. I mean, it just overwhelmed me how blessed I am. Do you realize how blessed you are? you in Texas. <laughs> they folk watching us right now that live up north. Proverbs 18, uh, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they're safe. Second Thessalonians 3, 3. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Many of us don't even appreciate how much God's protection over us has been until injuries and accidents and medical bills come in. Listen to me. When God provides, it may not always be in surplus, but it's always in sufficiency. Even if God doesn't give you what you want, he will always provide what you need. 
You get, you got, you know, sometimes you just can't limit God, but God didn't put Elijah at a river. He didn't say, Elijah, go hang out at the Jordan River. He said, go hang out at the brook. Brooks are unreliable. He said, I'm going to feed you with a raven. Ravens are unreliable. They, they, yeah, they, they, they're dirty birds. We'll talk about that in just a minute. I don't want to get there too quick. But they're unreliable. They don't bring food to people. That ain't what ravens do. Ravens are scavengers. They take food. Everything Elijah had was unreliable, unpredictable, and not permanent. Yet in the middle of that, God was providing. There are seasons in our life where God's provision is living from hand to mouth. Early in my life when I got born again, it was hand to mouth. I would make it. I remember having $20 to stretch from, from a, a Monday through a Thursday until I got paid. I remember opening a mailbox after asking for, for a provision and having a check in there from the state that I didn't know I was getting back on taxes. I remember living by taking RC Cola bottles and trading them in to get other drinks. I remember asking God, please don't let that needle go b- below that E in this old Chevrolet that I'm driving. Yes, I drove a Chevy. <laughs> 1970 Nova 350 orange and with a black top. And if I'm going to drive one, I want to drive a fast one. And then I got a gremlin. Oh, God help me. <laughs> Talking about provision that was barely there and making it. Just barely making it. Bible college, barely making it. Working jobs, barely making it. And I remember, I always had what I needed. Just had what I needed. You know, I didn't, I didn't have a, a gun safe because I didn't have guns. I, you know, you just didn't have it. Uh, it was, that was life for me. If I went hunting, I had to borrow a rifle. There are seasons that this happens in our life. I call it the season of just enough. Everybody say just enough. It's just enough. It's, it's just enough. And, and the children of Israel, for 40 years, they traveled through the wilderness for, with just enough. They had just enough manna every day. Just enough. Manna fell every day. God never allowed them to store it up. You couldn't store the manna up. It, give us this day our daily bread. It came every day. If you tried to keep it, it spoiled. It would spoil. It would turn in. It would get rot and it would just go bad. So you couldn't store up the manna every day. The manna fell. Manna, the word manna in the Hebrew language is, the word is, what is it? That's, no, that's the name of it. What is it? Because you could take it. I, I'll give you another name for it. Tofu. Because you could take it and turn it into anything. You have a manna bread, manna sandwiches, and manna casserole. Amen. And they couldn't have casserole. It would be the next day. Uh, but, but you could take that man and do whatever you wanted with it. Amen. Because it was every day. You got every day. But the issue was it was provisional for the day that God did that. It was just enough. I've always believed that God takes you from the land just enough to get you to the land of more than enough. Amen. Amen. But listen, don't covet what somebody else has. And don't compare your provision to somebody else's prosperity. You can't do that. Comparison always demoralizes Amen. Don't look at somebody else's house, somebody's car, something like that. You just thank God for what you got. Let me just say it like this. Prosperity depends more on wanting what you have than having what you want. I work this thing into my spirit. I told my pastor this this morning. I said, if there's one word that really sticks inside of me, is this word on prosperity. It depends more on wanting what you have. Go back and look and see what you have. Thank God for that computer that you got to play that games on. Mm. Prosperity depends more on wanting what you have. What do I got? Some of you forgot what you got. You have forgotten what you got. You got stuff hid up in your house, and you forgot that you had it. When we went through the flood, I found stuff in my house. I mean, all kind of stuff. My wife actually asked me, she said, well, you got anything you don't want nobody to see? <laughs> she asked the preacher that. I said, no, thank you. I already got rid of it. Because <laughs> I can tell you something, a flood will sure expose it. <laughs> can I get an amen? amen? We often have so many good things in our lives, but we don't want them. We keep 
chasing something else. The Scripture encourages us to be diligent, but not to be covetous or, or envy, amen, or having gratitude or fostering eternal unhappiness and attract more poverty than prosperity. Listen, love and appreciation, oh, to be thankful to God for what you've got. When God provides, it's both natural and supernatural. Hear me. God doesn't replace the natural with the supernatural. He adds the supernatural to our natural. I remember David Clower saying that, and I thought about it as I was working through this message. I thought, that's a, that's a powerful thought. God always adds the supernatural to our natural. The brook was natural. Ravens bringing food, now that's supernatural. First, you've got to get by the brook to get the ravens to bring you the food. Ravens are scavengers and, and, and don't even feed their own children. Amen. However, I want you to notice where God brought the ravens to Elijah. They're at the brook. God's supernatural will always meet you at the point of your natural. In other words, get a job. Quit sitting around going, God, you got to provide for me. You got to look. No, God says, you get a job. You start working, and I'll add the supernatural. I'll never forget when it was years ago, they started a church. Kenny, I, you didn't like me. I know you didn't like me. I knew it. He ran a feed store right next to the land that God gave us. I bought six acres, had six acres given to us by my first church, that, the land we bought. And it was low. The land was low. I went out there in my F-100 that my daddy gave me. It was the old coon hunting truck he had. F-100. It's, it's a six-cylinder. And it's slick tires. I got stuck. I had to go over to the feed store and ask Kenny to pull me out. But I knew he didn't like me. He's going to hell. <laughs> Weren't you, Kenny? Were you going to hell? Am I telling the truth? Probably. Okay. So you weren't young. You were, you were good. You were, you, you, you were all right. You were going to heaven, but he's going to hell. So, so I went over to get Kenny, and I said, Kenny, and he come over and pulled me out with his tractor. And uh, uh, we started a relationship after that. It, and, and not much one, but we started one. And, uh, and so we, we, were built, we were going to build a church. But the land was too low. We had the natural. What we needed was the supernatural. So my builder came to him and he said, listen, I have found a man that's got sand he's got to get rid of. They, it, I mean, the, the, the government has told him, you've got to get rid of all this sand down here around Laporte. And uh, you get ready to remove it. Now, and he needs a place to put it. Would you mind if he put it on the 12 acres here? I said, not at all. He said, how much would you pay him? I said, not a nickel. Because he's got to get rid of the, the sand. I'm just giving him a spot to put it. And so... He started hauling sand. 750 dump load trucks of sand raised the land up above flood level. So what God did is he took our natural and he added the supernatural. I've seen that all through my life. Where if you've got something natural, watch God as the supernatural. But don't sit there and keep asking God for the supernatural. Some folk are so super spiritual that they won't do a cotton picking thing. They won't work. They won't, they, won't, they won't give. They don't pray. They don't fast. They don't, they don't witness. They just sit back and believe God to take care of them. Listen, there ain't no such thing as spiritual welfare. I hope that didn't hurt your feelings too much. But if it did, deal with it. People who experience miracles in their finances don't just work hard. They pray hard. They pray hard. They believe God. They believe something's going to happen. Many believers, you know, they, they, well, leave that alone, Jerry. Okay, I will. Personal experience, though, I, I've been given, I've been able to give more and be more generous and give more extravagantly because God has blessed me. Amen. I've watched my life go when I lived in the land of just enough to a place where I have more than enough. And I've been able to bless and bless. I've given away vehicles and motorcycles. I've been able to bless others. Just privately bless. Many of you have too. That's the will of God in your life. Can I get an amen? Now listen to me. When God provides blessings, they come from the most unlikely places. You didn't expect it to come from there. I, he's sitting by a brook named Cherith. And he's, he's got water. Thank God he got water. Because there ain't no water. If there ain't no water, there ain't no life. 
But he's hungry, and all of a sudden, a black raven comes flying into there, and he got meat in his mouth, and another one has got a loaf of bread. And they come flying in, and they feed him in the morning. Ravens are dirty birds. Why wouldn't God, shouldn't God send a dove on the wings of a snow white dove? He sent his pure, sweet love. See, y'all didn't know I was that country, did you? <laughs> he should have sent a dove. I mean, that's what God do. But no, he sent a dirty bird. I remember many, many years ago, well, I'll go back to that church that first started there. I, I had a friend who, who was a worship leader at Gillies in uh, uh, that bar over in Pasadena. And, and, he, and I said, I, and he was a friend of mine. And I said, uh, Bill, I want you to come lead worship for me. He said, man, I can't come over there. He said, I, I've been playing music over here at Gillies. And I said, Bill, you've been practicing at Gillies. God been training you at Gillies. But you need to come over here and worship, lead worship over here. He said, I, he said, no, I got another problem. I said, well, what's that? He said, I work for Budweiser. I said, look at me. My family were bootleggers. You think I care if you work for Budweiser? As far as I'm concerned, God's feeding you through a dirty bird. Can I get an amen? amen? And I've always believed that. God will feed you through a dirty bird. Some people get so holy, so, so uh, sanctified. So uh, uh, self-righteous that they can only take finances from a, uh, 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 a cistern of holiness. You know, that everything's got to be just right. I've got to work for a ministry. Ah, uh-uh. I think where the money is. Go where the ravens are. Amen. Ha- get on up in there because I'm going to tell you something. God can bless you there. I-, I believe there's a principle here. The company you work for does not have to always have a cross in the lobby. Mm. Uh, your boss doesn't have to speak in tongues. Mm. Many believers refuse to work for some companies like that. But I'm going to tell you something. Daniel did not defile himself while he was with Nebuchadnezzar. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I'm going to say it again. Salt and light, that's what you are. Salt doesn't fear corruption. Light doesn't fear darkness. Amen. God used to prostitute to guide the spies in the promised land. God used a donkey to speak to the prophets. Moses grew up in a heathen place. God can use a wicked, non-believing place to bless you and use you. Amen. Just be light there. Hallelujah. Don't be afraid of the ravens. When I first got born again, the county I was in, Colbert County, Alabama, you were in Lauderdale County. That's why you come over to Colbert County to the bootleggers, to my grandma. That's why my grandma was a bootlegger, because the county was dry. I worked for RC Cola, and the county went wet, which means now they're able to have liquor. And I remember how I struggled as a believer, taking RC Colas into Kroger's or a convenience store and put it next to the liquor. I actually struggled. Because I thought, this is God, you've got to help me deal with this. Isn't that something? That I felt that way then? And God transformed me and helped me understand, sometimes I'll feed you through a dirty bird. Amen. Them ravens can, you know, look, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Tell God, no, I ain't taking, I ain't taking that pork chop. I don't want that bread. Uh Uh-uh. You bring them rolls back over to that steakhouse. I don't want them. Mm-mm. You send me a ribeye with a dove. Bro, when you hungry, you'll eat bologna. You'll eat spam out of the can. You'll eat twice a day, every day. Amen. He'd wake up in the morning, wash his face out of the brook, get him a big old drink of cold water, run through the brook, sit there, 730. Here come the ravens. Drop his food off. Thank you. Amen. He'd eat about 3 o'clock in the evening. Here they come again. He'd eat. This went on, went on, and went on. Amen. He's blessed, taking care of stuff. And then the brook dried up. In your life, you've had jobs that dried up. In your life, you've had maybe even places of ministry that dried up. Things happen in your life. When God's provision at certain times comes to an end, some of you retired. The job you had said, that's it. 
when it happens, you got to pivot. Everybody say pivot. To pivot, you pivot. You, you make a move like this. It doesn't mean that God's done with you. It just means you're transitioning. You're moving. In the church world, when God calls you to pivot, it doesn't mean you leave the church. It just means you transition to wherever God has for you. Amen. It, it might mean, oh, you know, uh, let me just say, uh, I, I walked out there in that garden with Frank, and all I saw was rain. And then I saw dryness, and that garden was awful. Nothing growed out there. Had one watermelon. One <laughs> watermelon. Work, Kenny. Work, work, work. One watermelon. I ain't doing that no more. What are you going to do now? Pivot. Maybe God didn't call you to be a gardener. <laughs> Why don't you pivot and go do something else in the church? Can I get an amen? We'll show you where a lawnmower is. God doesn't stop being a provider even when provision stops. When God's provisions were natural, supernatural, the natural ran, ran its course, and the ravens, they stopped coming one day. And all of a sudden, he looked down, and, and the, the brook began to dry up. Good times don't last. I'd love to tell you they do, but they don't. Some of you live a honeymoon kind of life. All of a sudden, you're married. Everything's wonderful. Give it a couple years. Oh, I'll say it again. Give it a couple months. Oh, I'll say it again. Give it a couple weeks. <laughs> Amen. It don't last. You, you have to learn. You got to grow. There has to be some pivot times in your life. You can be in the center of God's will, and yet your brook can dry up. God does not promise that the brook won't dry up. He promises that he will continue providing for you in spite of the means of your provision running dry. So the brook drying up was not a punishment nor was it caused by some sin that Elijah had committed or you committed. The Scripture states that the brook dried up because there'd be no rain. There was no more rain. It does not say that Elijah did not fast or pray enough. God did not give Elijah an explanation of why the brook dried up. He gave Elijah a redirect, amen, to where he would find his next provision. It's time for you to pivot and to move. When your brook dries up, don't go into excavation and start digging in the mud. Don't start trying to figure out why it's doing this right here. When your brook, brook dries up, it's time to pray and pivot. 88% of Fortune 500 companies, million-dollar companies in 1955, no longer exist. No longer exist. Why? They didn't pivot. They didn't pivot. Newspapers went out of business. Why? They didn't pivot. Magazines went out of business. Why? They didn't pivot. I was talking to my son yesterday. He said, Dad, you remember how you hated cell phones and said they'll never go over? Yeah. He said, Dad, you remember how you told us we would never drink out of a plastic bottle? That plastic that we should drink out of the fountain? Or get it out of a faucet? Because you were raised drinking out of glass bottles? And RC Cola, and that this right here should never go over, and that this is wrong. You remember when you told us that? I said, Yeah. Are you hearing me? If you don't learn to pivot, when God says pivot, when provision runs out, yeah, you're in trouble. The word of the Lord came to Elijah telling him to rise and go to another place. When the season ends, we have to listen to God's direction and pivot into the new season. What is he telling you to do now? Where, where is he telling you to go? Then God, listen, when God provides for you, it's good. But when he provides through you, it's better. He was providing for one man sitting by a brook. But then God said, pivot and go to Zarephath. Now I'll tell you, when the rain stopped, that was a rebuke to the god Baal. When he said, go to Zarephath, hometown of Jezebel. What is God doing? He's moving this prophet closer to his destiny to fight against Ahab and the prophets. He's positioning him and he's showing him miracle after miracle after miracle that I'm going to provide and I'm going to be with you. No wonder Elijah was so arrogant when he got to the mountain. He knew God was going to take care of him. So he goes to a place called Look at that again. Go back to that again. I want you to see this again. This is the will of God for everybody in this house. So you say, well, I, I, 
I, I can barely take care of myself. Then take care of you. Take care of you. You deal with you. I always say, if I'm on an airplane and that plane starts going down, that mask comes down, I put the mask on me before I can take care of my children. If you don't take care of you, you can't take care of nobody. Take care of you first. Believe God take care of you. But after God blesses you, don't you hoard it up. Don't hoard it up. Don't get arrogant. With all, look at all the stuff I got. Start allowing it to be a blessing to others. Bless your children. Bless your spouse. Bless your family. Bless those around you. Amen. Bless your peers. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. So this is important. When God provides for you, it's good. But when he provides through you, amen, it's better. That's where we're heading. Then in 1 Kings 17, 8, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Get up. You're sitting by a dry creek. Get up. Go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. Dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there. I'm going to close with this, sis. Amen, because I can't preach all this right now. I've commanded a widow there to feed you. I told a widow there to feed you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So he got up. He went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow, which is an indication her husband has died was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Remember, three years, no rain. He's been drinking by a brook. She ain't had a whole lot of water. As she, and as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me some bread. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked only a handful of flour in a jar and a little bit of oil in a jug and now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and then we're going to die this is how bad the famine was hmm. and Elijah said to her don't be afraid now, what gets me here is, as God said in the very beginning of this, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. When he got there, he said, bring me something to eat. And she said, I ain't got nothing for you. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> God said, I told her. And he got there and he said, oh, oh, God, I thought you said you told her. And Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterward make something for yourself and your son this is a, this is a moment of faith it's all, it sounds selfish don't it feed me first and then you're going to be alright it just sounds selfish you've been eating with meat and bread for how, how long hmm and then he said for thus saith the Lord now he's going to give the word of the Lord the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall never run out, will not run out, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and she did as Elijah said, and she and he, and she and he, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour never ran out, neither did the jug of oil become empty because according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah so every time every time she went in to get flour she pulled I have memories of my mama with a blue Tupperware bowl and flour and she'd pour a little buttermilk in it and she'd knead that buttermilk in there to make biscuits and, and the flour always was there on the edges and she just kept adding to it adding to it to make them biscuits every morning for my daddy a wonderful memory and she poured that oil Crisco best oil in the world she would pour that oil and the next day she'd come back to make a cake if she poured that oil the next day she'd make a cake she poured that oil what a miracle a provision of what the Lord had done through Elijah. Had he not got there, she'd have died and the boy would have died. But he got there and it was their salvation. It was important.
Because at the brook, only Elijah got fed. In the widow's house, a family was fed. What if God brings us to a season where it is not just you that will be taken care of, but you will have enough to care for your elderly parents, your kids, a widow, a widower, people around you? Don't you want? Isn't that where you want to be? That's where I want to be. Why not us, God? Why not us? Why not, can we get to that place? Remember, God's ultimate goal is to take you to a place where other people's needs will be met through you. You got to think bigger. You got to move to another level. You got to start believing God. You know, I was a sheep. Now I'm becoming more like a lion to believe God for the best. I believe still in my heart there are businesses in here that have yet to be birthed, but it's conceived inside of you. That there is an entrepreneur spirit in this house and those that are even watching that it's inside of you that God can birth out of you. Amen. That you can start believing God at whatever age you are, that you start believing in God and he starts providing for you. I know, I know, Susan, you even said this to me this week, the, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. The dirty birds out there. There's a lot of dirty birds out there that's got your money. They got to bring you some bread and some meat for those of you on that meat diet. Amen? Amen? Heads bowed, eyes closed. You ain't where you want to be yet. I said, you ain't where you want to be yet. You got just enough, but you believe in God to take you to more than enough. Lift your hand right now. Come on. Lift your hand. Don't be afraid. Oh, that you would bless me. Enlarge my border. We're not here to be prosperity people, prosperity preachers. God, we want more than enough than we got because we believe in prosperity. We believe you can take a man and feed him by a brook with dirty birds. We also know, God, your will is to bless people through us. And God, if you can get it through us, you'll get it to us. So God, I ask you to bless the hands that are lifted, that you give us faith to believe, that businesses would start, that hearts would be compelled, God, not to hoard up, but to release. And by releasing, we bless others, not just in Texas, but around the world. Help our hearts connect to the missions and those that need it. God, help us to start thanking you for what we already got, not for what other stuff we want. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Come on, give God praise in this house. Come on, give Him praise.